welcome everyone to the Church of Philadelphia. I hope everyone is doing well. So I'm, so I'm really, really sorry for not um, having Bible study on Wednesday and on Friday. Um, I'm not physically sick. I'm just going through a lot of things um, emotionally. Um, I, I just haven't been feeling good because of all of the events that have been happening, I just wanted to take some time for myself. And um, I've been fasting, and I don't um, usually publicly announce that um, because I believe in what Jesus said, that when you're fasting, not to let people know about it, not to complain and stuff like that. And it wasn't because of fasting that I don't feel well. It's because of the events that are going on that I'm just not feeling well. And I just didn't have the energy that I needed in order to give you guys a good study. So um, I didn't want to bring any of my feelings that weren't directly pertaining to what we were talking about into the Bible study. So that's why I kind of pulled myself away from it. Um, but I encourage you, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because I encourage you guys all right now to fast. It is important to fast for what is going on in our world right now. It is a spiritual warfare that is going on that you have no idea what is going on behind the scenes. And I'm going to make a separate video on something that the Lord had told me a while ago, I posted it on my personal Facebook um, years ago about the things that are going on in this time right now. I didn't publicly announce it. I was going to, but the Lord asked me not to. Um, so I didn't. And um, But I'm going to have my mom on with me because she was there during the times of when I was telling everybody and she can, you know, attest to what I, I had told her. Um, so this isn't, as you see right here, uh, this is Songs of Song, and it's 1-5. And this isn't directly pertaining to the particular Bible study that we're doing right now, but um, I, I really felt in my spirit that the Lord wanted me to tell you this. So this particular scripture, and I don't want to hear anybody object to this. This is what the Lord showed me. Okay. This was written for black women, this particular scripture, and I will tell you how I know for a fact. When I was really, really young, the Lord used to take me all the time and teach me things, and I will let you know the things that he has taught me. Um, a lot of times he'll show me things in a vision and um, as a child, I don't, I have a childlike mentality. So, you know, I'm just thinking that we're just kicking it, you know, he's just showing me cool things, you know. And then as I get older, I start to realize how deep it really was. And so this is. The scripture I wanted to show you guys today. We're going to get into the Bible study, but I am black but comely, daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. <clears throat> this is what he showed me about this particular scripture. When I was a child, he took me to heaven and I was watching a girl and she was standing outside the gates looking upon the earth. And there was a slave woman 
who was a black woman, and she was crying. And um, those were her, these, the daughter was so connected to these women. And she was so upset because the woman was crying because they were making fun of her complexion. She was so angry, she turned around, she ran back inside, and she went into her courtyard, and she started fighting. And this is what she wrote. And I'm crying because this has been going on for so, so long. And it has to stop. It is sickening. I never grew up with family members teaching me to hate someone because of the color of their skin or their culture. I was fortunate enough to be raised by people who didn't care about that. And the first person who ever taught me what racism was, was a cop. When I was a kid, I had friends of many denominations, many cultures. My grandparents, my mother, my uncle, my aunts. Nobody had a problem with it. Nobody cared. Nobody. It was never a problem. My mom was friends with a woman who, whose husband was a police officer and we went into the mall and there was a group of children playing hacky sack. And I loved hacky sack, I wasn't good at it, but they were really, really good. So I ran over there because I wanted to watch them play. Now this is in the city and there's not many places to play in the city, except for in the streets or in the mall. These kids weren't doing anything wrong. They were just being regular kids. And his daughter ran over there with us, with me. And uh, he screamed so loud for her to come over. And he would, I've never seen him so angry. He was vexed. And in my mind, my mom said to me, she said, well, this is just, come on, let's go. And in my mind, I kept thinking in my head, well, what happened? What did she do? You know, I had no idea what was going on. But I'm still, I'm trying to understand because the whole time we're there, he's just so outraged. He's not saying anything. But he, you can just tell he was pissed. <clears throat> and I asked my mom, I said, why is he so mad? She said, we'll talk about it later. So I'm still trying to figure it out. It was bothering me. And I couldn't understand. I couldn't come up with a reason at all. I said, we weren't doing anything. They didn't do anything. I don't understand why he's so mad. So we finally get in the car and I asked her as soon as we got in the car, I said, so why was he mad? And she said, I think he might be racist. So what is that? And she said, where they don't like someone because of the color of their skin, because of the race. I said, well, why wouldn't he like them? She said, well, maybe he thinks but they're not good. I don't know. I said, but they weren't doing anything bad. They were just playing like normal kids. And she couldn't give me a good reason because there is no good reason. And that was the first time I realized about racism. And so it, it put some insecurity inside of me. Not saying that I believed it. I just became a little insecure. Before I used to run and play with them, and then I started thinking, well, do they think that I'm, I'm racist because I'm white? 
is their mom not happy because their kids are playing with me? And I started questioning things that I never questioned before. Never. And it hurt me so bad and I lost all my respect for this man. I thought there was something wrong with him in his head. Like, he's not wrapped too tight. There's something wrong with him. And I couldn't trust him. Because I knew I could trust my opinion. Because I knew they weren't doing anything wrong. And I just want to say I have so much respect. Because if people are honest with themselves, if they are truly honest with themselves, they couldn't handle it. Not even for a day. They would have lost it. They would have completely lost it. And so I want to apologize to each and every single one of you who have been hurt in this way. I want to tell you that that has never been in my heart. I have seen it over and over and over again ever since that moment that my eyes were open to it. And uh, I'm just really sorry. But I wanted to give you guys some encouragement and let you know about this part of the scripture. And if anyone debates it in the comments, I'll just erase it. I'm not putting up with it. I know what the Lord showed me. And I remember when I was coming back after he showed me that, <laughs> I looked at him and I said, so what? Because I was a kid, I said, so what do I look like? And he showed me what I look like. And when you go to heaven, you you forget about everything on the earth. You know, it's, it's like you never knew anything on the earth. And then... He showed me myself, and I saw that I was white. And so I realized when I was in heaven that his people were black. And I said to him, I said, I'm white. And he said, yes. And I said, does that mean I'm going to hell? <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> I used to ask some silly questions. I mean, you would think, you know. A journalist could ask better questions than I do. But, you know, that was what was in my heart. I started realizing. And, and we're going to get more into uh, the history, the true history, um, later on in our Bible studies. But, and it doesn't mean, the answer is not that white people go to hell, but, but, um, the people in the Old Testament most of the people in the Old Testament were black. And that's the truth. And that shouldn't matter to you. And the only reason why I'm bringing attention to it is because it was taken away. And it's an identity that was taken away over and over and over again. And that identity belongs to them. So it shouldn't mean anything to someone who is white or a different race that they're black but it, it means a lot to the black community because of their history of things being taken away from them and that's why I'm bringing it up it's for them it's for no one else so again I apologize I encourage each and every one of you to fast during this time and to pray for the healing of all nations, um, to let love and let God and holiness rule all nations over the world, and um, just, you know, that God makes all the right decisions for us and that God leads us. And, um, yeah, it's really important right now. During, when you see things like this, don't just pray. Fast and pray. 
when when you see that the world is going through some really really hard times like this because we're all connected and that's why i say the whole world we're all connected the coronavirus started in china all the way on the other side of the world and every single country every single continent is affected because we are all connected so when something happens to one of us, it's happened to all of us. All right. So that was my rant. Um, not exact. I, you guys probably think I'm a crybaby because every single time I come on here, I cry for something. All right. Anyway, <laughs> you're probably like, oh, goodness, this girl's crying again. All right, so we're going to get into our Bible study. And um, we're going to read the rest of the um, of the book of Esther. And then I'll break it down for you guys and show you the connections to the things in the Old, uh, New Testament. All right. Chapter 4, Mordecai Seeks the Aid of Queen Esther. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent remnant of clothes to Mordecai, and t take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for a haytack one of the king's chamberlains, whom had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai and to the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews, to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Sh at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it, it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplications unto him, and to make a request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hatak, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whatsoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to him to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer, Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliveries arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Sushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, nights, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. 
Chapter 5 Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her, ro her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the, thr in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, the shield be obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What will thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Because Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman forth the day, joyful and with a glad heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends, and Zeresh, his wife, and Haman told them of the glory of his riches, and the multitude of his children, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, ye, yea, Esther the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then says Jerush, his wife, and all his friends unto him, <clears throat> Let a gallows be made a fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king, and it was found written. The king rewards Mordecai. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. It was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king of Hasaris. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman 
was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to be honored more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let his app this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal whom the king delighted to honor, and bring him on horseback through the streets of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse, and arrayed Mordecai, and brought him on horseback through the city, the street of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning, and have, having his head covered. And Haman told Jerish his wife and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his, wife, his wise men, and Jerish his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, then shall not prevail against him, but shall surely fall before him. Second Banquet of Esther And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains, and hastened to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, what is thy petition, Queen Esther, and it shall be granted thee? And what is thy request, and it shall be performed, even to the half of the kingdom? Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request, for we are sold, and I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed where on Esther was, then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews, enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. Esther 
set Mordecai over the house of Haman. The second royal decree. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the, Ad the Agagite and, he's, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I find found favor in his sight, then the things seem right before the king, and I pleasing in his eyes. Let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are all in the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king of Hasarah said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I, get, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged up upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writings which the writ is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's rings may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at the time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, in three and twentieth day thereof. And it is written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which were from India into Ethiopia, and hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Hasar's name, and sealed it with the king's reign and sent letters by post on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for the prey, for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing of a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that the Jews should be ready against the day to avenge themselves on their enemy. So the post that Rod rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on the, by the king's commandment. And the decree was given at Shushan the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, <clears throat> and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, Whethersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Chapter 9 Victory of the Jews Now in the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar, in the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had ruled over them, they hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in the cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their, heart, their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And all the rulers of the provinces, and the lieutenants, and the deputies, and the officers of the king helped the Jews, because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. 
For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, and slaughtered in, destru in destruction, and did what they would unto those who hated them. And in Shushan the palace the Jews slew and destroyed five hundred men, and Parshan, Datha, and Dalphon, and Aspatha, and Poratha, and Adalia, and Aridatha, and Parmashata, and Harasai, and er Eridai, and Rahasatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew them. But on the spoil laid they not their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan, the palace, was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther, the queen, The Jews had slain and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan, the palace, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition, and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further, and it shall be done? Then said Esther, if it, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan, to do tomorrow, also according to this day, is decreed. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it to be done so. And the decree was given unto Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the fourteenth day, also in the month of Adar, and slew them, slew three hundred men at Shushan. But on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy of and five thousand. And they laid not their hands on the prey. And on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rest of day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth day, and on the fifteenth day of the same they rested, and it made it a day of feasting and gladness. <clears throat> Therefore the Jews of the village that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day, and of sending portions to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king of Hazaras, both night and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month of Adar and the fifteenth day of the same year. As the days were in the Jews rested <clears throat> from their enemies in the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, and as Mordecai had written unto them, because Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagites, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast per, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter, by letters that the wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore they called these days Purim, Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore all the words of this letter, and of that which they had seen concerning this matter, and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them, and upon their seed, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail, that they would keep these two days according to their writings and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept 
throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, and that these days of pairing should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial the memorial of them perish for from their seed. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the hundred twenty and seven provinces of the king of Hasaras, with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed, according to Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoyed them. And as they had decreed themselves and for their seed, the matters of the feast, the fasting in their cry, and to decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. Chapter 10 And the king of Hasaras laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him. And they were not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia. For Mordecai the Jew was next unto the king of Hasaras, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. The Parable of the Banquet so the servants went out into the streets and gathered every one they could find, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he spotted a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless. Then the king told the servants, tie him hand and foot, and throw him outside into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, if we don't read the Old Testament, we're never going to understand who this man is. People are going to say, oh, it's Satan, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. Okay, the Bible tells you exactly who it's referring to. In Esther 4. <clears throat> Right here, it's Mordecai. When Mordecai learned of all that he had that that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Okay, let's read that again. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing and loudly and bitterly. Let's go back to this again. He was thrown out into the outer darkness of the city where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth. His clothes was not dressed in wedding clothes. We see that here. He tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. But when he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven in sackcloth. In every province to which the edict or the order of the king, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And that's where the rest will be thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of the teeth. (sighs) 
Many are called, but few are chosen. So when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants, okay, these are the people that he, the king told the servants to tie him hand and foot and throw him outside. So this is referring to the servants, the eunuchs and the female attendants. Eunuchs are virgins and the female attendants are the daughters of Jerusalem came and told her about Mordecai and she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of sackcloth, but he would not accept it. He wouldn't put them on. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money, including the exact amount of money. Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Now let's see what this is talking about next after all of that. Then the Pharisees went out and conspired to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are honest and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You seek favor from no one because you pay no attention to external appearance. So tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This right here is connecting you to this part of the Bible. Okay? About the money. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money. Haman? Haman? Who is Haman? had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He, Haman, is Caesar. So they're testing Jesus to see if he knows the scriptures. The Pharisees went out and conspired to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples. They wanted to see how well he knew the scriptures. To tell to him along with the Herodians, the teacher, they said, we know that you are honest and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You defer to no one because you pay no attention to external appearance. So tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And his response is, but Jesus knew their evil intent and said, you hypocrites, why are you testing me? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Whose image is this? Whose image is this? He asked. And whose inscription? Caesar, they answered. So Jesus told them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Let's go back here. He also gave him a copy of the text of the for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go out into the king's presence to pay for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. 
Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their life. So the gold scepter is his mercy. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back the answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have to come to your royal position for such a time as this. So, to come to your royal position for such a time as this. Okay, destruction. This is happening during a time of great destruction. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. This is the time we're living in right now, you guys. It's time to fast. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all the, of Esther's instructions. So let's go here. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him. Now they're talking about the resurrection here. And she said here, if I die, I shall die. Teacher, they said, Moses declared that if a man dies without having children, his brother is to marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. So why are they asking this question next? Because remember, this is around the wedding, the time of the marriage. Now, there were seven brothers among us, okay, from the Old Testament. The first one married and died without having children. So he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brothers, down to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, then whose wife will she be on the of the seventh? For all of them were married to her. Who is this woman they are talking about? See, people think that this is referring to all marriages. We got to stay focused on what Esther is telling us, pointing us here, and what and this is pointing us to Esther. Whose wife will she be of the seven, the seven sons? For all of them were married to her. Your sons will be married to thee. Jesus answered, you are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. 
in the re resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like the angels in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? <laughs> oh, this is why I like, I like Jesus. Even if he wasn't Jesus and he was just, you know, like anybody else. This is why I like him. He has a mouth like me. <laughs> but concerning the resurrection of the dead, like, this is your this is your department here. This is what he's saying to them. But concerning your resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? He's he's saying this to him. Being like, listen, you don't need to worry. In the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like the angels in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, remember, let the dead bury the dead. Have you not read what God has said to you? This is a dead man walking right here. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What he really said is the Father. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's telling him, listen, I'm not your father, so you don't need to worry about it. Wow, this is why I like Jesus. He has a lot. He has a mouth like me. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Why were they so astonished? Because he put them in his place. Like he's telling them, "Listen, you're just a zombie. You have no soul in you. You're not one of mine." And when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they themselves gathered together. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. I mean, sorry. One of them, an expert in law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Jesus declared, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Okay, so what was the first commandment? To honor thy father and mother. Was it not? Who is he telling your uh, father and mother is? He said, love the Lord, honor your father and your mother. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So for all those parents out there to say, I repeat this and reply it to themselves, he wasn't talking about you. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were assembled, Jesus questioned them. Flip the script. What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? David's, they answered. So we learned when we read about... Um, well, actually, I don't think I brought this up yet, but when we go to read um, and learn more about uh, King Solomon, um, when we read the book of Kings, David, the reason why David could not um, build the temple was because he shed blood. Well, it, God granted him the power to do what he did. It wasn't because he was a sinner. Um, well, it obviously, yes, because he was a sinner, but he shed blood and we are not to kill.
but he doesn't, David is not condemned to hell for it because God turns around and says that when he dies, he's going to be sitting in the king, you know, with his four forefathers. So we know he doesn't go to hell. You know, he, he's not a bad guy is what I'm trying to say. He is a man of God. He died as a man of God. However, this prophecy was to be given to a man of peace. So then it was given to King Solomon. And he said that King Solomon, well, he didn't specifically say King Solomon. But King Solomon, Solomon means man of peace. So when we say King Solomon, we're referring to David's son, his literal son, right? But King Solomon doesn't necessarily mean David's literal son but it could mean his descendant, okay? And this is how, this is why he's referred to as King David in the Bible. Be, I mean, King Solomon in the Bible because it means man of peace and it doesn't specifically, entirely pertain to David's literal son. He said that the one who builds his temple is going to be a man of peace who never shed blood, and he will be my son. That's what it says. Who, whose son is he? David's, they answered. Is he King Solomon? That's what they're asking. How then does David in spirit call him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. People still ask this question today. People still ask this question, well, what does that mean? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under under your feet. Does that mean that Jesus is God? Jesus is the father of mankind. But he is the son of God. And he is a part of the heavenly family. So if David calls him Lord, how could he be David's son? <laughs> because he came before him. See, people are still trying to think with their cardinal mind. No one was able to answer a word, and from that day, no one, no one dared to question him any further. Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples and the scribes. So let's get back to this. So I just want you guys to have a good, good understanding for, for what's going on. So let's read this. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. She put on her royal robes. What does that mean? This is after she dies. Because remember, she says, if I die, I die. She's going to die. She's going to die to be with the king, but also for her Jewish people. So she puts on her clean linen, her white garments, her royal robes, and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. This is spiritual, you guys. This is in heaven. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter. What did we say the gold scepter was? Mercy. That was in his hand. Oh. So I'm not crying. Don't worry. <laughs> 
So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. So she also has a table, a banquet prepared. Bring him in at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman's rage against Mordecai. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife. Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials. He was closest to him. Who else was closest to, to God? Satan. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Jerish and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. So he thought he was going to destroy him. <clears throat> Mordecai honored. That night the king could not sleep so he ordered the book of the Chronicles the record of his reign to be brought in and read to him and read to him. So here it's very important to read the Chronicles. Okay. They're directing you to the Chronicles. The record of his reign to be brought in and read to him. I'm sorry, when I said the scriptures, I said the king's book. I'm talking about the chronicles. Earlier when I was talking about King Solomon and, okay, I was talking about chronicles. I apologize, okay? All right, so the chronicles, the first part of the chronicles talks about the lineage, okay? King uh, David, all the way up until King Solomon. It was found record there that Mordecai had exposed Bithana and Teresh, two of his king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Zer I, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to try and butcher it. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him. His attendants answered. 
The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? Okay, <laughs> like, what? How dare he? So now that we're reading this, we're kind of going back in time, aren't we? Because now we're really understanding the sin that uh, Satan had committed, that Lucifer had committed to fall. Okay, we're starting to understand. So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on his head. So the robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden. Okay, the robe that Jesus Christ died on the cross with and the donkey that he rode on. One with a royal crest placed on his head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him. This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on the horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is, this is what is done. For the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Jerish, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Jerish said to him, Since Mordecai before you, whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. As they were drinking wine on the second day, the king, so on the second day, as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king asked, so on the second return, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to the half of the kingdom, it will be granted. So she is given, his inheritance is split with her. The Queen Esther answered, I have found favor with you. Your Majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. So now she is showing her identity. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Exus, I don't know. Ask Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, an adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. 
the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? So remember, in the other study, while the king was away, in Songs of Solomon, um, some of his soldiers beat her and raped her. And this is what the king is saying here in Esther. Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. Uh, he dug his own grave, you guys. Hallelujah. He had it set up for Mordecai. Yeah, he got played. Who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Isn't that crazy? Like, you, you, you dug your own grave there, buddy. The same day, King X gave Esther the estate of Haman the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther pointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She bade him, to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended uh, the gold scepter to Esther, and she rose and stood before him. So this is the the blood, the two dur turtle doves, the, the blood of the one turtle dove, dipping it, the blood onto the head of the other turtle dove, the gold scepter, the mercy. If it pleases the king, she said, and if it, he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he, if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches the Haman son of Hamadetha the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? These are her people. King X replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you and seal it with the king's signet ring for no document written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring can be revoked. At once the royal secretaries were summoned and the, on the 23rd day of the third month the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps and governors and nobles, the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were given in script 
for each province and language of each people. So spread throughout all the nations. Remember earlier when I was crying <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm white. Does that mean I'm going to go to hell? Right here is the answer. I'm going to stop for a second and I'm going to tell you another vision that God had given me. So the one time he took me to heaven and I'll go more into detail, but I was going through um, some really hard times. Um, this man was trying to kidnap me and I'm not going to get into every single detail because that's not what this is about. But um, I was a very playful child. I would go outside and play every single day, riding my bike, playing with my friends. I was never in the house, ever. And I went through such a depression. I was afraid to go outside. I was afraid to go away from my mom because I just thought he was outside somewhere waiting for me. He had made several attempts at kidnapping me. And so um, I remember I was watching a movie and the fields, it was kind of like the fields of Ireland, you know, like those plush fields. It kind of reminded me of the fields I would see when Jesus would take me to heaven. And so um, I was like, wow, so beautiful. I wish I had a place like that to play in. And later that night when I fell asleep, the Lord took me up to heaven. And it was a burst of light and the light slowly subsided and I started to see more clearly. He literally took me to a field just like that. And we stood there for a minute and he pointed to his left and I looked over and there was the Holy Spirit. And she was tall, pale, with long red. I mean, her hair goes all the way down. Um, and it's long red hair, very beautiful. She's fair. She's just so beautiful. And I said, wow, she's so beautiful. She was there with all of these children. And there was um, an angel there, um, a male angel, walking them over to us. Um, he, he was accompanying them. And so when I said, wow, she's so beautiful, I said that in my mind, and she heard me, and she started to smile. And the children came over, and they started to play, and they were singing a song, and they were dancing. And I said to him, I said, I know this song. I know this song. And then I started thinking to myself, I said, I wish I could play with them. I was saying it in my mind. And he took my hand away from him. Uh, he took his hand away from me and he said, then go. And I looked at him. I thought he was mad at me the way he said it. And I took his hand again and I said, no, I'll stay here with you where I'm safe. And he let go of my hand again. He said, it's okay, Melissa, go. So I went over with the kids and we were dancing, we were singing, we were having so much fun. And then they started running off into the field. And so I'm chasing after them. And they're so fast. They're so much faster than I am. And they, they started going all the way back to the end of the field. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention this part. The whole point of why I was saying this. When the kids were dancing and singing with me. At first I didn't notice. They all, you know, not that they all looked the same, but... There was nothing distinguishing nationalities to me. Okay, that's what I mean by it. They looked the same to me. There was no nothing like, oh, this kid is Asian, this kid is this, this kid is that. No. But as I started looking closer, I started realizing they were of different nationalities, different languages from all over the world. Okay? That's the reason why I'm bringing that up. But I want to finish it so I can... I, I want to finish it. So the kids ran into the forest and I stopped. And I wanted to turn back around to ask the Lord if it was okay. And I thought, I said, well, he said it was okay before. And he was mad when I kept questioning it. So if they're allowed to go in there, I'm sure I'm allowed to go in there too. So I ran inside the forest 
and I couldn't see them anymore, but I could hear them laughing as if they were hiding from me. And I'm looking around, I can't find them, so I kept running and running. And then I didn't, I didn't hear them either, and I couldn't find them. So I stopped and I got scared and I said, you better turn around before you, I think you're lost before you can't find your way back. And I turned around and the Lord was standing right there. He was behind me and he had his hand out for me and he took my hand. He's a man of very few words. I talk a lot, but he's a man of very few words, but he knows how to reach us. And we might not understand the message at first, but eventually we'll understand it. And so the first part was the part of where I recognized that I was one of the children because I knew the song. The second part was this right here. These orders were written in the script for each province and language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. So it extends out to all nations, to 127 provinces, from India to Kush. Isn't that awesome? And then the last part of that vision that I understood was, no matter how far I run, no matter how fast I try and get away from him, no matter how lost I feel I am or how scared I am, I am. So no matter how far I run, how lost I am, and how scared I am, the Lord is always right there behind you. And that has been one of the things that have carried me through all of these years. And I wanted to share it with you. So maybe it will resonate in your heart and you can carry that with you as well. Mordecai wrote in the name of King X, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted carriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. So what are these horses, you guys? Again, this is like the entire return of the Lord, okay? This is telling you the parts that, you know, Matthew is mostly, Matthew and Revelation are mostly the books that are written for the end of times. And as well as these books in the Old Testament. These books in the Old Testament will give you the insight, the things that you say, well, what is that? Well, what does that mean? And you're stuck on it. The reason you're stuck on it is because it's most likely in the Old Testament. So Mordecai wrote, King the X is and sealed the dispatch in the king's signet ring and sent them mounted carriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. Okay, so these are all the horses that they come riding on. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day, so remember it says that, you know, it says about how these enemies will um, will be destroyed. <clears throat> the day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King X was the 13th day of the 12th month, month of Adar. A copy of the text the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on the day to avenge themselves of on their enemies. So the law will be given to us by the Jewish people. Remember it was prophesied that the, that the Gentiles are going to cling on to the coat of a Jewish man for them to teach them. The couriers riding the royal horses went out, spurred on the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and 
a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor, in every province and in every city to which the attic of the king came. There was joy and gladness among the Jews, the feasting and celebrating, and many people of other nationalities became Jews, became Jews, because fear of the Jews had seized them. On the thirteenth day, the twelfth month of Adar, commanded by the king, was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews was hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King X to attack those determined to destroy them. So I want to make this clear that Israel was divided into two sections. Okay? Israel was divided into North Israel and South Israel. And, uh, so, well, I'll get that into that another time, okay? But the Jewish people are not just the Jewish people that we see today. We'll get more into it later. But there's the northern Israel and um, southern Israel, which are, they were brought into the Jewish culture, the northern Israel. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King X to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces and satraps, the governors and the kings and ministers helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and he became more and more powerful the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. <clears throat> In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parsha, Parsha Andatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aradatha, Parma, Shata, Erasa, I'm sorry, Eridai. Okay, we'll just, you can read it. The ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those ki killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king the same day. The king said to Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and 10 sons. So this is just, you can go through all of this. This is the, um, at the end when they were given permission to rule over uh, the people and to do whatever they pleased. Okay. That's this prophecy here. Mordecai record these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King X near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun doing what Mordecai had written to them for Haman's son and Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and cast the, the pur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. So um, we're going to learn more about the lot, okay? That money um, has a lot to do with um, everything. And, when you read about um, these other, we'll get more into it, but um, 
we're going to understand what this money is all about, okay? Because it has a huge significance. The the lot that um, that was um, that's connected to Haman, okay? The payment given to Haman. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back unto his own head and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim, the word for Pur, because everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it to, on themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should withhold, fail, observe these day, two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. So, okay, I'm going to speak directly to, specifically to people that were descendants of slaves. This day, okay, that they're referring to here, you should learn more about this so that you can use this day as a day of celebration. Okay? Because know what was promised. Everything that God promises will happen. It will. Okay? I remember in the scriptures, <laughs> I forget who it was who said this. Was it Jacob? I don't remember. But they said to God, how much longer will my people be slaves? Are we just made to be slaves? And no. I want to tell you this. God tells us in the Old Testament why they were chosen. And it was because of their faith. And we see their faith being tested more than anyone else on this earth. And the reason why, I mean, obviously they came to God, they went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but they kept coming back and they kept having more hope. They never lost hope. So don't ever lose hope. Okay? Even if it doesn't happen in your generation, you put that hope into your children's heart so that they pass it down to their children's heart because we know that what God promises will happen. No doubt. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. These days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. That's what I'm talking about. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, <clears throat> along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Axis kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated time, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had dec decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and limitation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. King X imposed tribute throughout the empire to his distant shores, and all his acts of power and might together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted 
and they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew was in was second in rank to King X, Pier Aramit among the Jews, and held in high estate by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. All right, so we are living in some troublesome time, but don't let it outweigh all the things that are good coming out of it. Okay. Fast and pray. Learn God's laws, his commandments. Learn them well. And most importantly, also learn his feasts and celebrations. And I will try and help you along as much as I can. But it's upon us too to study to make ourselves approved. So I encourage you to self-seek as well um, with the spirit. Spirit brings truth to all people. The Holy Spirit is the best teacher. I can't do this without the Holy Spirit. And neither can you or anybody else in this world. So, as I was reading this, I was realizing that I was meant to read this because I was going to read this reading years ago. And as I was reading it, I said to myself, well, this was definitely supposed to come for this time. I hope that this scripture here is an encouragement to you guys. I hope and pray that you continue to be encouraged during this time. Please fast. Um, I, I can't make you, but I, I encourage you to do so. Fast and pray. And um, I love you guys always. I hope you guys are all doing well. I pray that you guys have everything that you need, both physically and spiritually. And I thank you for listening to some of my rants as well as the Bible study. I hope that you have been able to get further insight through this study. Um, there's so much in here. I mean, I could literally go on for days. I try and pull out what I feel is the most important connections and hope that you guys can figure out the little things here and there, but I try and show you the big picture that's within each of these things. So if you guys like this video, please share it, like it, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. And anyway, until next time, you guys stay blessed. Bye. I'm very sorry, but I wanted to add this one last part because as I was reviewing it, I realized I did not put in something very important. So when I said that Mordecai was that man, yes, he represents the Jewish nation that did not bow down before Yeshua the, when he, on his first coming. They refused to bow down and to worship him and they did not accept him as his Messiah. And so therefore the death punishment was put on them because they refused the king. However, as we learned going through the study, it, the roles were reversed, okay? Because it was actually the nations, the government, Satan, that we learned in Revelation, um, the beast, that um, was actually setting out for the destruction of the Jewish people. So I wanted to make that very clear that yes, initially the man dressed in sackcloth that was put into um, the weeping and gnashing of the teeth was Mordecai who represents the Jewish people. However, as we saw through the study, um, 
salvation was brought to them through the second coming. And instead, the roles were reversed on those um, that were their enemies, which was the government. Okay. Satan. Okay. There's a spiritual part of it and a physical part of it. And the physical part is the the government, the um, the ruling of the nations. So I wanted to make that clear because after I reviewed it, I realized I did not say one of the most important parts of the study. So I apologize. And so again, peace and blessings to all of you. Goodbye.